I've been looking forward to this conference because um, it's one of those rare occasions where my two jobs come together. I'm uh, a translator four days a week. Um, I translate for a media company. I translate short descriptions for TV programs, documentaries and series and stuff and films. And that's by no means the Bible. They're like 25 words max. But a translator I am. And the remaining three days a week I'm a philosopher and I'm interested in language, the philosophy of language, among other things. And I don't have weekends, if you can calculate that as well. As a translator, I'm well aware of the challenges that come with the job. Even such the simplest translations, which are the ones that I do, they, are, they end up still quite difficult. I, translate, I easily translate 50 texts a day, and near... Almost every one of them is difficult and doesn't, the translation is not exactly equivalent to the source text. So a lot gets lost in translation. The other day I was, for instance, translating an episode of the Harry Bikers. And the description said, in this episode, the Harry Bikers prepare a toad in the hole. Well, that's fine. In this episode, the Harry Bikers prepare a. But how do I translate toad in the hole to Dutch? We don't have that ditch, ditch in Holland. Most Dutch people, which is the target audience, they have no idea what it is. They've never had one, and they don't know what it is. So I can translate it literally, pot in het gat, which rhymes nicely, that's very nice, but still it won't make any sense. So what do I do as a translator? Well, the best option in this context is to explain it. To, in this episode, the Harry Bikers prepare a traditional British dish of sausages in a Yorkshire pudding batter. And perhaps skip the Yorkshire pudding, because the Dutch people might not even know what that is. And um, so you end up with an explanation, rather. And that's an easy example, and gets much more complicated when you're translating poetry, for instance, or something where style or aesthetics has to be preserved. So um, I think we will encounter many of those examples of difficulties in translation in other papers today, so I will keep it to a minimum. Um, I found these lovely illustrations online of uh, words in various languages that cannot be, uh, for which there is no equivalent in English. So I have them throughout my PowerPoint presentation and I will not elaborate them on any further. On them any further. So uh, in German, for instance, Wald Einsamkeit means the feeling of being lonely in the woods, and we don't have an exact English word for that. So, um, so I take, whoop. yeah, I take this to be uncontroversial. I have two uncontroversial starting points, and I think the first is a lot gets lost in translation. I think that's uncontroversial. There's, it's just not the case that for every uh, word or sentence in the source text, there's an equivalent in the target language. Not everything, not every aspect um, of the source text can be preserved in the translation, like rhyme, style, uh, cultural association, <coughs> forms, things like that, wordplay, metaphors. Not everything can be preserved. Yet, I think it is equally um, uncontroversial that um, translations can be done. We can tell, without a trace of a doubt, that the King James Version is a translation of the Bible and not a translation of the Kama Sutra or the Tao Te Ching. And um, although there are profound difficulties in translating the Bible, and I think Nick King can tell us a lot more about that, um, we can tell when we're dealing with the translation of the Bible, whether the translation of a different text altogether or maybe an entirely new uh, text. So, as a philosopher, um, I am interested in how we can explain both phenomena, both observations equally well. So that is my, uh, my task for today. I, have, uh, I propose a pragmatist perspective. Um, I propose a pragmatist approach to translation. And um, for those who uh, is, are not f uh, familiar with pragmatist thought, a pragmatist, I take that today to be somebody who believes that the norms of practices are implicit in that very practice. 
So they are imminent rather than transcendent. And a pragmatist looks to reconstruct the norms that apply to a practice from the practice itself rather than to apply external um, norms to a certain practice. So suppose, um, and a pragmatist takes a practice to be rule governed. So suppose you have the game of chess. The game of chess is defined by its rules. If you, you can't say, let's play a game of chess, but with different rules. Because if you play the game of chess with different rules, you're not playing the game of chess at all, you're playing something else. So um, for pragmatists, it counts for a lot of human practices. The rules that govern the practice, the normative uh, guidelines for that practice are implicit in the very practice. And I think that counts for translation as well. At least that's what I'm um, trying out today. So norms implicit in translation determine that it is translation that a person is doing rather than writing a new text or editing a text or copying a text. And um, I hope to make explicit some of those norms. My talk will consist of two parts today. Firstly, I will make the, my case against what is known in the literature as the incommensurability thesis or conceptual relativism, that's an alternative name. I will argue that difficulties in translations, which we all take uh, to be uncontroversial, ought to be not to be blamed on a tension between the source and the target language, but on a tension between context, contextual circumstances. In the second part, I will discuss what I believe to be a better explanation of the incommensurability thesis. I will take a text to be a communicative act. And then we can translate, we can explain a translation as a rendering of that act in another language. So let's call that for the time being communicative equivalence. That's what we're aiming for, rather than formal or functional or dynamic equivalence. One intuitively appealing a uh, way to explain why so much gets lost in translation is known as the incommensurability thesis. That is the thesis that languages are in tension, therefore translation is impossible. So it, it, that is the thesis that explains that uh, translations get stuck because there is an inherent diff mismatch between the source and the target language. And that is, is intuitively appealing because we can all see quite quickly, you don't have to be a translator for that, that not all English words have equivalents in French, for instance, or Dutch. And um, so it's quite obvious that not all languages, ma languages don't match word by word, or even phrase by phrase. And there's metaphors in one language that are different in another language, or for which there is none available in another language. So on that level, languages certainly are different Language. There are many different languages in the world, so they're not the same. However, that's not the same as saying they are in tension, and that because of that tension they cannot be translated. Um, the incommensurability thesis comes in stronger and weaker forms. The strongest form would hold that uh, each language is completely incomparable to any other language, and that might sound a bit bizarre. I think anybody who masters more than one language, even, though, even a little bit, will know that there are some things that match between, well, there's greetings, for instance, and that we all got in all languages, or at least more than one. And um, so that the strongest version of the incommensurability thesis might be a bit bizarre. But weaker forms, milder forms, might hold that languages overlap, but partly diverge and they are partly in tension, and that, that explains translation to difficulties. And that is a much milder version, and that is, in fact, quite appealing, and indeed quite popular. And, um, however, I will argue that we also should abandon those milder versions of the incommensurability thesis. But I think it is bad practice to uh, create a straw man of your opponent. So I think I will first 
um, make the case in favor of uh, the incommensurability thesis, or at least show what, uh, what is appealing about it. And before I uh, point out what the weaknesses are and why we should abandon them, there are um, two families of theories of meaning. And if you want to say something about language and whether it is translatable, yes or no, you need to appeal at some point to a theory of meaning. You need to ask the question, where does meaning get, uh, language get its meaning from? How does, that, how does that work? Well, there are two, roughly speaking, two families of theories of meaning. And they go by various names. You call the first realist and the second phenomenologist. You can, um, you can call the first representationalist and the second um, expressionist or anything along those lines. It depends on the purpose of the paper in which they occur. But I call them for this uh, today. I call them the first group the scheme content model, and the second group, the world disclosure model. And uh, the scheme content model has uh, proponents like the philosophers Kant, Quine, Kuhn and Feyerabend, uh, big names, quite uh, well represented, uh, especially in the Anglo-American world, but also in Germany. Um, and the world disclosure model has uh, proponents like Hamann, Herder, Humboldt, Heidegger, and Taylor. So both th traditions are old and widespread. We start with the scheme content model. Uh, this model originated as a reaction to early modern empiricist representationalist views on language. And it was in the Anglo-American world the default view until Davidson shook it in his essay on the very idea of a conceptual scheme in the 70s. So that it, it has been very popular for a very long time. It's an established view. It's no longer taken for granted, but it's still influential. And you don't, it counts for both of these groups. You don't need to be an incommensurability, in, incommensurabilist, ugly word. But do, um, if you're in any of those groups, both groups have both incommensurabilist and commensurabilist. Anyway, the scheme content model holds that there's one reality. Here we go, this, this is part of it. That's, that reality is uh, there, it's just here, independent of our observa observation. If we were all to disappear with the red button, then this room is still here, uh, just as it is, and that is reality. And we experience reality via our senses, and that is the only unmediated access we have to reality. We receive sensory data, sounds and vision and things, just um, surface irritations, so to speak. We receive data. However, just receiving data doesn't enable us to make anything um, with those data, to do anything with it. It forms an unintelligible blur as such. So, um, in order to make, to form thoughts, we need something that makes it intelligible. We need to conceptualize the reality or our, our experience of it. And according to proponents of the scheme content model, that's what language does. Language conceptualizes uh, the unintelligible blur that comes at us by experience. Right. But then we have Davidson in the 70s, and Davidson says in his uh, essay on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, as the title suggests, that he says like, a conceptual scheme that doesn't make any sense. Language can't be a conceptual scheme, it's self-defeating. And um, he shows us step by step. He, imagined us to, he invites us to imagine what it actually means for a language to be a conceptual scheme. And he points out that there are four ways in which we can think of that. Two, there are two ways in which we can think, we can, how we can answer the question, what does language then conceptualize? Well, that is, I'll show that. It can, it can conceptualize the world or reality of the universe, or it can, can conceptualize our experience of it. Right, there are also 
two ways in which language can do the conceptualizing. It can do so by organizing it or categorizing it, or it can do so by fitting or mapping the world or experience. So we end up with four options, and Davidson rejects them one by one to begin with. Um, language can't organize realities, says Davidson. Because one can only organize pluralities. If you set about organizing a drawer, you organize the things in it. You don't organize the drawer itself. So you can only organize things that are already individuated as a set of pluralities. So he says, if, um, if, you, if language would organize reality, then before we do the organizing, we must already acknowledge that there are things, the individuated things, in other words, to have individuated those things, you must already have conceptualized them, and then that means that language can't, uh, can't do that. And the same counts for, um, for experience, in a way. Expe you can only conceptualize ex or organize, if that is the metaphor you want, organize experiences. And if experiences are things like seeing red or feeling warmth, then Davidson asks, it's weird to say that language does only that. Like, surely, language does a lot more than only organizing experiences. Or in Davidson's words, and I quite like this quote, he says, surely knives and forks, cabbages and kingdoms also need organizing, not only experiences. Well, maybe then organizing isn't, um, isn't the metaphor we're looking for. Maybe we like to think of language as mapping the world. So language fits reality or language fits experience. Well, says Davidson, that might be the case, but if it only fits reality and doesn't do any organizing, then he says, I have an easier way to say, to talk about that and to state that, that language is, is doing that. And he said, that's saying that language is true or that its sentences are true. And he says, that's much easier. Why come up with all this complicated theory about the conceptual scheme? If you can just say, with language, we can make true sentences. So Davidson's alternative is uh, to think of language as uh, describing truth conditions and stating things about the world, talking about the world, and whereby you can um, explain that one sentence means um, whatever makes it true. So, um, the book is blue means the conditions that need to be in, uh, in place uh, in order for the sentence that book is true, uh, blue to be true. So then um, that, would, that would determine the meaning of that sentence. Right. Davidson quite shook the debate by saying that because the conceptual scheme idea was quite taken for granted. But um, it's not without critique. Um, and I think much of the critique on Davidson's paper is, uh, is justified. Um, Davidson focuses very much on truth conditions, and many people say, and I believe that's true, that um, we do a lot more with language than stating our beliefs or saying what is true or what we take to be true or what we doubt that it is true or talking about the world and just stating facts. We do, um, we do a lot more like jokes, Indonesians joke apparently. <laughs> and, um, but we also make small talk, we greet, we reflect on things, we express ourselves, we establish interpersonal relations with language, we share things with one another and we hide other things. Um, so, and these things are often not really reducible to um, truth talk. So, Davidson's critique is justified, but he still st maintains himself with one foot in the, um, in the scheme content camp because he still assumes an independent reality. Well, then we have, we have an alternative. Let's see how that works out. Um, Proponents of the world disclosure model offer an alternative picture. I follow Charles Taylor, Charles Taylor's account, because I think it's both clear and complete. So I thought that's handy. I'll use Taylor then. 
And uh, according to Taylor, uh, when we say something, like stating a fact, but it can also be other things, we do uh, one or more of these three things. Uh, we articulate something we previously may have struggled to find words for. We thereby bring something to our awareness. I always believe that London is the capital of England, but days go by without me explicitly thinking so or stating it. But when I do so, I use language to state this belief of mine, thereby bringing this particular uh, belief in the spotlight so that I can reflect on it. Secondly, we use language to create a public sphere. When I say, lovely weather, isn't it? I'm not giving you any new information. You can see for yourself whether it's lovely weather or not. It, what determines the meaning of that sentence is what I'm doing with it. Namely, I establish with you something that we share. We thereby um, share a bit of obviousness. We share um, um, a bit of information that, uh, that we both know about. And we, have, we don't have a common ground. We have uh, something in public between us. We're not, no longer um, different individuals who individually think that the weather is nice. We're now sharing this matter. It becomes a public matter. And the same, the same counts for what we're doing today. We're now making public our concerns about translation rather than our concerns about what the capital of England is. So we, make, we use language in order to um, share a matter of public concern. So we're sharing things. Thirdly, we use language to make differentiations between things that are not just obviously there in the world and coming at us via experience, uh, and things that are nonetheless essential to human lives. Uh, moral, religious, and aesthetic vocabularies are good examples. Uh, things like freedom, dignity, faith, um, and as feminists have pointed out, masculinity, femininity, are things that are not just obviously there in the world, and non-linguistic animals uh, will not really uh, fill their lives meaningfully with any of these words or any of these concepts. And the same kind for specialist jargon. Uh, nearly everyone has the bodily requirements to learn to play the flute, but a certain, at a certain level, one can't achieve further mastery of the skill, um, without also learning a certain vocabulary and words like diaphragm vibration and lip tension and crescendo and staccato, things you need to know in order to be able to produce, to practice that skill. So these are things that we use language for and they can't be reduced to a representative relation to reality. Um, we create, construct and disclose parts of our world with the language. So, Taylor argues, in line with Herder, Humboldt and Heidegger, that since language determines our world, if the world about which we speak is constructed with the use of language, then different languages may disclose different worlds. Well, that seems to make sense. The world of language speakers is not accessible simply by sensory experience alone. One can only access the world of, a language, of language speakers by engaging with that language community and entering that public sphere. And I think, um, to a certain extent, that is indeed the case. Um, that's also how you learn a new language, for instance. So, Taylor says, text disclose a part of the world belonging to that language community, to the language in which it in which it is written, and to an outsider, a um, speaker of another language, so, so someone who doesn't master that language, that world isn't accessible simply by translation. Um, so that a translation is, will not succeed in transferring the meaning of that text. So in short, different languages disclose different worlds. Therefore, language is class and translation fails. Taylor is a, um, supports the aversion of the incommensurability thesis. But that doesn't follow. Like Taylor, I believe uh, that the world disclosure model is much more promising than the scheme content model. But I think Taylor blurs a few distinctions that I think we should make. Firstly, there's language as a general phenomenon. We are all language speakers. 
Dutch people are language speakers, Chinese people are language speakers, we're all um, language speakers. So there's language as such. That is to be distinguished from natural languages like English, Mandarin, Dutch, German, French, and Hebrew. Such natural languages, again, are to be distinguished from what we metaphorically may call languages, but what, what are actually more like vocabularies or jargons or more, other more limited language games or discourses. Religious language, for instance, falls in this category. Now, I think it is true that jargons and discourses disclose worlds to us which we don't have access to if we don't master that jargon and don't participate in the discourse. But a jargon like that of philosophers can be developed in every natural language. I know philosopher jargon in both Dutch and English, for instance. From the observation that philosopher jargon opens up a new world than religious language does, for instance, doesn't follow that English and Hebrew disclose different worlds. In fact, English doesn't open up a world at all. Neither does Hebrew. English doesn't do anything, because English isn't an agent. English speakers do things with language, with English in their case, and Hebrew speakers do things with Hebrew. And as Taylor rightly points out, the things we do with language, articulating, sharing and differentiating, are things we do as language speakers in general, as linguistic animals, as Taylor puts it. These functions are not specific to any particular language. So while Taylor's argument is very insightful, and I agree with his premises, nothing in his story merits his support for the incommensurability thesis. Right, it's one thing to provide a critique of people, but if you've got the critique, then I think you should come up with a better alternative. So I thought I'll, do, I'll try and do that. Then. So I made my case against the incommensurability thesis, but now we have the question, what explains translation difficulties and successes? So in order to answer these questions, I propose a pragmatist approach, as I said. We've seen that linguistic animals do various things with language, and that what they do with language determines the meaning of their sentences and exclamations. Suppose we say that, say that same counts for text. Just let's try that. It's, it's a bit of a thought experiment. I suggest that the answer to what sort of thing is a text might give us some insight about where its meaning might come from. Once we have an idea about that, we might ask what that means for the translator, if anything. So what is a text? We can outline a number of features of a text. I'm not saying that this is a fully covering definition, but at least think these things count for every text. A text is a piece of written rather than spoken language. That means that it has clear spatial, spatial temporal limits. It's written at a certain time uh, of, or over a certain period of time. And at some point, presumably all its copies will be destroyed beyond recovery. A text has a lifespan like a living being. That means that a text has at least one author and at least one addressee. The author and the addressee may be the same person. When I write shopping lists, I write them for myself, usually. The addressee, however, is the person the author imagines when she's writing the text. This may be vague or an imaginary addressee. If I write a book, I imagine a certain readership. I may not actually know who's going to read my book. It need not be a concrete person. The addressee may also be someone else than the people who eventually get to lay eyes on the text in the course of its lifespan. I therefore make a distinction between the addressee and the audience of a text. A text also has a certain coherence, however rudimentary. Not every collection of words or sentences on a piece of paper is considered a text. Several texts can be bound in one volume, or one text can be bound in several volumes. And a text has a certain purpose, however insignificant. There must be a reason why the author decided to write it down. And as the text has an addressee, the purpose must have something to do with the addressee. The author aims to inform or persuade or convince the addressee, for instance. 
Therefore, I argue, a text is a communicative act. Well, if something is a communicative act, then Habermas raises his hand because he's got to say something about it. His universal pragmatics, which he wrote down somewhere at the end of the 70s, takes a speech act as an example for analysis. According to Habermas, every speech act, insofar it is a communicative rather than a merely ritual speech act, implies three claims that the speaker must implicitly make, otherwise the speech act is pointless. Um, it is worth to note that these three claims, the speaker need not be reflectively aware of it. So each speech act implies a truth claim, a normative claim, and an authenticity claim, as Habermas puts it. For instance, if I say, I promise to come to your party, then I'm implicitly saying that it is true that I'll come to your party. And not that I'm polishing your shoes or washing the dishes, I'm coming to your party. I'm also making a promise rather than an assertion or a question or a threat. I thereby appeal to certain norms, which I take to be in, form, in force. I have now given you permission to hold me accountable if I don't show up. And that is, I also claim that it is appropriate for me to promise to come to your party. So I'm assuming, for instance, that you've invited me. Thirdly, I must imply that I'm sincere, that I actually mean what I say and that I really intend to come to your party. If any of these three claims is doubted by either the speaker or the hearer, then the communicative act will fail. And I will fail to, um, to make you count on my presence at your party. So that's um, a very brief outline of Habermas's universal pragmatics. And I will then wonder how can it apply to text? Can it be applied to text? And if so, um, what does that mean for the translator? And I think it can be applied to text as well. So, following Habermas's universal pragmatics as applied to text, um, I, because I see text as a communicative act, as a language act, I propose the following definition of a text, of a translation of a text, rather. So, text A is a translation of text B if the truth claims are the same in both texts, so that the propositional content is equivalent. The propositional content, a sentence is often, an assertion is an expression of a proposition. Proposition is what, what can be true or false. A sentence can't really be true or false because a sentence is just a configuration of signs. It's just words. A sentence can be written large or small or in this font or that font, but it's, it's content, what, it's sa what the sentence says its proposition. That can be true or false. So the propositional content of both texts should be the same. Text A then establishes the same relation between author and addressees. So author and addressees, not author and audience, as text B does. And the distinction again between addressees and audience is relevant here because um, take Paul for instance, St. Paul, we will be hearing more about him, I suppose. He wrote um, 1 Corinthians, for instance. To whom? To the Corinthians, not to 21st century Brits. So the Corinthians are his addressees and not 21st century Brits. So to translate 1 Corinthians as if he is trans uh, addressing 21st century Brits is moving away from translation and into editing a text. And one may have good reasons to do so, but translation it is not. Now, according to my definition, which you all may challenge, I hope. Um, then the author of text B should be able to commit to text A. So the, the author of the source text should be able to commit what is said to what is said in the translation. A translator may be creative with formulations and expressions and form and style. But if the translator writes um, suggestive sentences in the translation that the author of the source text can't be taken to be committed to, then that's a case of editing, not of translating. <laughs>
Fourthly, Shakespeare's plays, for instance, are often published in versions that are accessible to children. And that's great, so that children can appreciate these lovely stories. And the plays then rendered in a prose, in the sort of English that children understand and appreciate. However, we normally wouldn't call that translation, we would call that an adaption of the text. So an essential feature of translation is that it operates from one language to another. But what about the difficulties that the translator encounters? In my opinion, these difficulties ought to be explained with reference to context, not to language as such. Often, a translator is expected to do a lot more than translate the text. She's asked to translate for a certain purpose. Translators, of course, are commissioned by people for certain aim or goal. So the, um, the purpose for which the translator is commissioned might diverge from the purpose for which the author originally wrote the text. I don't think Paul had any purpose with 21st century Brits. I think he had a particular purpose with the Corinthians. But a translator might nonetheless be interested in questions like what sort of letter would Paul have written had he written to 21st century Brits? Or um, what sort of effect could Paul's letter to the Corinthians have on Brits? Or um, what happens if 21st century Brits just simply happen to feel addressed by Paul's letter, even though it's not directed to them? And those are all legitimate concerns, I think, but they're not implicit in the English language or in the Greek language. They are not Paul's concerns. And they have everything to do with the context in which the translation is commissioned, and very little with the source of target language. A text has a lifespan. A description of the episode of the Harry Bikers has a lifespan of two weeks. Maybe I think that most translations that I do disappear after a week or two, maybe a couple of months if, it's, if the episode is repeated a couple of times. And texts like the Bible have a lifespan of millennia. Like everything else that has a lifespan, like you and me, texts have a, uh, a history that affects their reception. Texts may have profound effects beyond the purpose for which it was originally written. Politics get involved. Translators of the Bible may have different concerns after the Second, Second Vatican Council, for instance, than before. And I think that's, that's easily explained, and that's a good thing that that is the case. But surely, Paul didn't suddenly say, try to tell the Corinthians something else, because two millennia later, some Catholic officials got together and rethought things. And surely, the Greek language did not suddenly change, and surely English is still English. So what is changed is the translator's assignment, not the languages. So a translator is hardly ever commissioned just to translate a text because her client has found this mysterious text and just wants to know what it says. Most translators are asked to translate for a certain purpose, to inform a certain audience, certain audience with certain cultural assumptions, like I I'm I'm have the task to inform the Dutch TV watchers about the Harry Bikers episode, and they have certain cultural assumptions which do not include knowledge of the toad in the hole. And for the use of religious practices in churches, in faith communities, for instance, and they may have certain sensitivities, and those sensitivities might change over time. Or for textual analysis, for academics, maybe you then need a completely different translation. Or you might want a translation that can be enjoy enjoyed by readers who appreciate a literary or poetic <coughs> style. Or perhaps you want a translation in which all of those things are taken into account. And what conflicts here, and what makes the translation difficult, is the negotiation between these various purposes for which the translation is committed. And so the, the, these new circumstances may conflict with the language act that was originally done by the author of the source text. 
So the translator has to appeal to her professional expertise to find the best compromises and to make the best negotiations. And no, no translation theory can give conclusive advice on this. You can have some guidelines and it may be very useful, but conclusive advice is not available because each translation project has unique um, set of purposes or unique circumstances. But the language act of the source text author to his addressees does not conflict with any language. So to resume, languages are different, surely, but not necessarily intention. They have different aesthetics, different grammars, different vocabularies, different idioms, different metaphors, but they're not intention because a language act can be done in any language. And the text as, text as such is a language act. I therefore also believe I'm a holist rather than an atomist. As you may have guessed, I believe that a text, a sentence maybe in a context, is the smallest unit of language that may have a meaning. I don't believe words have meanings, for instance. Um, and a, a text as such has a meaning, and that is the act that it is. And that can be done in any language. So instead, instead of a tension between languages, I propose that the tension is between the demands of the different contexts, one in which the original text was created and another context in which a translation is commissioned. And that, I argue, explains translation difficulties and not a tension between source and target languages. Thank you very much. Are there questions or challenges? Or people who violently disagree with me? You, you talked about the concept of a, a language community. Yeah. And you refer to German and Dutch and English and so on. Now, in English, I would have thought there are numerous language communities, and you can almost translate between them because their language and their concepts behind that language are different. Uh, well, that's a good question, because it hits the nail on the head, really. Um, it is, um, to a certain extent, that is true. That is to say, in Nigeria, people speak English, yes. and in England, people speak English. And um, I once had a marvellous misunderstanding between myself and a Nigerian friend, because we meant something completely different by the word animal. And... Um, he thought it was ridiculous that I thought that a mouse was an animal. And um, that was um, because he said a mouse is a pet, because pets live in the house. And, um, and a pet is not an animal. But, so there are, um, yes, there are certainly um, differences. However, I think um, those, and, and the, the limits of a language are blurry, of course. But some of those differences, I think, can be explained as cultural differences, and therefore uh, you would think of, the, of Nigerian communities as cultural communities, rather than a different language community. I think, although language and culture cannot be thought independently of one another, they are nonetheless not the same. I think everyone who speaks English, if you can, if you as an English speaker can understand um, a text written in English by a Nigerian uh, and grammatically and, and, and the words, then I think you have, you're speaking the same language. The misunderstandings usually uh, can be traced back to a difference in belief. For instance, a Nigerian might assume that you hold the same beliefs about what a language is. But I think also people in England can have um, um, disagreements about what they take an animal to be, if you get into really expert language with biologists or zoologists, then the, even the de definition is hardly ever uh, clear cut. So I think even in English, people can have disagreements about concepts. I think that's rather can be traced back to explained by a difference in beliefs and assumptions than, um, or commitments or values 
rather than the difference in language. Bridget? Martha, thank you very much. It's really very interesting and I enjoyed it greatly. I think you defined at some point a text in written form. Yeah. And I wonder if there's room to extend the idea of a text into non-written performances or other... Yes, I've been thinking about that. Because you've got a text as an act. Well, a text as a written form, a text as an act, an act as a written form. Mm. It's one that's about film, about... Yes, um, however, yeah, and you can um, read a text out loud, and I think the, the format in which you reproduce a text certainly has a different effect on its audience. But um, I think we'd only call something a text if at some point it was written down. I think you have like these folklore tales, like Little Red Riding Hood or something, and they say they existed much longer before they were for the first time written down. And I think you wouldn't call Little Red Riding Hood a text before it was ever written down in some form or other. You might call it a story still, a narrative or things like that, but a text, I, I don't think that's... So when does Red Riding Hood change from a written story into a film or an anime? Yeah, then it's still an adaptation of the same text. But then, uh, as long as it's, it's so, I think that's still part of its lifespan, so to say. In the lifespan of a text, you, at some point it's written down, and I think that's the beginning of its lifespan. And then lots of people do things with it, like reproduce it, make adaptations of it, edit it, illustrate it, uh, to read it out loud, read it to their ch grandchildren, make a film of it, or th things like that. And I think that's all part of its lifespan. And I think the end of its lifespan is only when all possible reproductions of the text um, are destroyed beyond recovery. So I think films are part of its are just part of its lifespan. But they're still, of course, they're closely related to text. Yes. Could you imagine a group of people who had? a particular story that they told again and again and again and I, at least in theory I can imagine this group of people memorizing it perfectly and identically that in practice that probably doesn't happen because the use of the story will change over time but if we imagine a period of say 10 years in which a group of people teach each other in succession precisely the same linguistic configuration and reproduce it each time precisely. Is then the distinction between what has never been written down and what could be written down, is that an important distinction anymore? Um, well, it, whether it's important, I don't know, but it still is the distinction between the text and the non-text. It's an unspoken, uh, reproduced story or language act or I'm not saying that only text are language acts, mm -hmm. they're spoken language text, but language acts. But um, I do think that you still wouldn't call that. Even if it's word by word the same and, and reproduce generation after generation, it's still a, it's a story, surely. And uh, but to call it a text, I don't know if that's... Linguistic. Yeah, it is a linguistic configuration, surely. But if it's a text, I don't... I don't uh, you might say so. Um, you might call that a text, but I, I don't know if that is if that really matches the common use of the word text that people do. I think we usually associate a writer with a text and a written use does seem to indicate something that was written down at some point, even if it's on this occasion being recited from memory or whatever. Um, and we do tend to talk about story or narrative for things that circulate possibly identically for generations in an oral tradition. It's just that our common usage also seems to imply that oral transmission shifts and changes in a fluid way. But once it's written down, it is fixed and the same. And there will be examples in, in some of the talks about how that's not true. Um, no, I don't think that's true. A text. 
I don't think a text has the same configuration all over its lifespan. I have a lifespan, I, I change a lot in the course of my lifespan. And I think that's, um, that can be, uh, I would say that the text might change. Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, you celebrated the context that's very important for all these things. Yes. And uh, I'd like to reinforce what Jonathan says. You know, I am aware of oral traditions in a number of parts of the world which are astonishingly constant. Yeah. And which, in terms of, of, of constructing a body of, 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 of narrative, um, to all intents and purposes, function in the way in which it, what, what I think we're talking about as a text is functioning. The other thing I'd like to say is that I think we are, those of us who are part of cultures which are primarily written cultures, tend to assume that texts are very important. And people who aren't don't necessarily think of them that way. So it's very much a context perspective. Yes, I think so. Yeah. But I'm not, I mean, just because my talk is about text doesn't mean that I think they're very important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't think they're really important, actually. <laughs> yes? Um, I think thank you very much indeed for the talk. I, I mean, I was very convinced by the, the idea that incommensurability work doesn't work. Um, thank you. But the, as far as I'm entitled to an opinion, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, but it seemed to me that there were. What I wanted to ask about was the idea that translation is the transference of propositional meaning. Which, which it clearly is. I mean, uh, to a certain level. I mean, I mean the, the translation must convey the same proposition yeah. as yeah. the source. But must it not also convey something about the style and register of the original? Um, um, I mean, if you were to do your Harry Vipers piece and say, Behold, the Harry Vipers do create affairs over the whole. Yeah. Be the wrong register. <laughs> um, I think. I think that depends on, on, on the assignment of the translator. I think it is a correct translation if you ask, suppose for whatever reason, people would find um, Dutch people um, in the year 4000, find some English uh, descriptions of Harry Biker episodes, and they want them translated to Dutch. I think it's good translations if the if it suits the purpose, if they translate it to whatever style is accessible at that time. So I think what it, what the style you use in a translation depends on your purpose of the translation. I think if you do it for textual analysis, I think you should preserve the style of, in which it was written. If you translate the Bible so that children might be able to read it, then I'd recommend against it. But I think that's, um, that's a contextual... That would be what you're calling editing rather than translation as such. Yeah, well, th it is. I, I think those sort of um, negotiations are editorial negotiations, but I think all editorial decisions, a range of them, can all fall within what is a translation. So within, I don't think there's, of every text there's only one possible good translation. I think there's a range, and the good translations in a certain extent, they're good because they suit the purpose. I suppose my point is there could be a bad translation which nevertheless conveys the propositional content. Yes. But bad for reasons of being the wrong register or the wrong style. Yes, bad in the sense of it doesn't fulfil the assignment for which it commissioned very well. Yeah. We may find that the coming hour <laughs> illuminates this particular, this particular topic of conversation even, even further. Um, perhaps we've just got time for one more quick question. We have to. Sorry, I'm not very familiar with philosophy of language, but I, I couldn't understand you when you said words don't have meanings, only sentences. Yes. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why two year old grandson would agree with that. Oh no, many of the people won't agree with that. But <laughs> when I got off the bus, or when I get off the bus in my part of the world, it's customary to say, thank you, driver. But yes. some people say, cheers. And yeah. everybody knows what that means. Yes, well, let's say um, sentences have meaning, that is, sentences in context. I don't even believe that sentences out of any context have any meaning. And I take sentences to be broad enough to include uh, a variety of communicative, even abbreviated linguistic ex expressions in a context. So let's say utterances have meaning. Just 
And utterances can be um, coherent linguistic acts that just happen to consist of one word. But I think the word cheers, without any context, has no meaning. I, it only has meaning in the particular context of set two bus driver and so on. I don't, also don't believe Apple. For instance, the scheme content people react to um, a group that I didn't discuss, which are the empiricists. And they believe that the word Apple means the representation of an apple. So it means that thing, or it means a representation of that th thing, or it means a, th a concept in my mind of what all apples have in common, something like that. So there's a representationalist relation. And I do not believe that. I think um, words as such have no meaning, and in isolation cannot have a meaning, only in a context if they consist of a communicative act they can have meaning. And sometimes that is just, that happens to be one word. 